Hello everybody, my name is Leonie Bell and I'm the director of BNA Dundee Scotland's Design Museum. We're still waiting for people to join us, but as time is tight and we've got so many brilliant speakers, we, we wanted to get to get started. Um, it's a really warm welcome from quite an autumnal and drizzly day in Dundee to all of you. Uh, please do keep popping in your names and where you're from. It's really wonderful to see so many neighbourhoods across Dundee places across Scotland and the UK, but also around the world um, coming up. I think while we're still apart doing these online events, it always feels like we're part of something when people pop up where they're from. Um, so huge welcome to this event tonight. Um, it's in partnership with the Scotland and Venice partnership, and you're going to hear more about that in a little minute. Um, I hope that those of you that are being able to travel to Dundee or in Dundee, being able to see the What If Scotland exhibition, it's been an amazing thing for us to do. One of the first shows that we've done in, in the learning rooms within v and Dundee, one of the first dedicated to looking at architecture in, in this way. There's still time to see it and to come back if you haven't already been or if you have been. It's on until the 21st of November. Um, hosting What If Scotland at v and Dundee has actually prompted us to think quite a lot as an organisation as well. But of course, we're all thinking a lot about how we live at the moment anyway. The need to reflect on where and how we live is not new. It's as old as time, it's as old as humanity is. However, in the face of the climate crisis, and as we still learn to adapt to COVID-19, more of us are thinking about how we can live more carefully and more locally. COVID-19 continues to have a huge impact, impact on how we live and interact within our communities, across our neighbourhoods, in cities and in town centres. It's prompted many of us to think about how we might live differently, the choices we make, the values that we carry forward into our futures. It brings sharply into focus what we all need to live well locally, what do our neighbourhoods mean to us, and really critically, who gets a say in what matters most, who gets to ask, what if? The 20 minute neighbourhood, the focus of tonight's discussion, is a way to radically reconsider cities, what are our tangible and intangible needs? And what design rights should every resident of a place have fulfilled? In many ways, Dundee's the ideal place to be a city made up of 20 minute neighborhoods. It's small in scale, yet it offers huge possibilities to think differently. Great progress has been made in Dundee. Active travel's at the forefront of many policy agendas. Green spaces are being reconnected to waterfronts and town and city centers. But roads and cars and a prevailing sense that some neighbourhoods are adrift from the riches held within than other still often prevails. And also, what if we don't all want to live in cities? What if living in more rural settings is good for us and for the planet? What does a 20 minute neighbourhood mean then? Tonight, we're going to be joined by a wonderful panel who are going to share their thoughts on all of that for this event entitled What If We Lived in Places of Small Distances? Now, unfortunately, due to illness, one of our speakers can't join us tonight. That's Tessie Britton. But we're really confident that everybody else that's with us is going to have loads to say. Um, each speaker has been given five minutes to talk about 20 minute neighbourhoods. And then we're going to give quite a lot of time to audience and panel Q&A. So please do join in. Before I hand over to the brilliant chair and panel that we've got with us tonight, I'm going to go through a few practical functions. Some of you are going to be uh, pros on Zoom. For some of you, this will be new. This evening's talk, as all our talks are, is BSL interpreted by Bruce and Heather. You can spotlight Bruce and Heather's video by using the three dots on the top right corner of your video boxes and selecting pin video. We also do, as I said, encourage you to ask questions throughout the talk using the Q&A, and we'll get to most of those at the end. If you'd like to use the closed caption function, enable this on the bottom bar. And I'm hoping that as I'm speaking, you're getting all of this information in the chat box as well. So thanks to the team at BNA Dundee for doing that. And of course, the conversation will take place on Twitter and other social media platforms as well. So please do tag at BNA Dundee and at Scotland and Venice if you are taking the conversation onto Twitter and other social media platforms and also use the speaker social links. They've also been posted on the chat box as well. So to start us off, um, I'd like to introduce our brilliant chair, uh, an individual that I've got to know a little bit quite recently. And um, we've been in meetings with him where he's made me think differently um, and really enriched every conversation that we've had. It's the brilliant Dr. Hussam Alwear, an architect, planner, urbanist, and award-winning author. Hussam is currently reader in sustainable urban design at the University of Dundee, 
and has an interest in not just the future of sustainable places, but also in understanding their past and their histories, not just the places, but also in how neighbourhoods work and, of course, how cities can thrive and flourish. Before I, we join, are joined by Hussam, there's a, a partner that we'd like to hand over to first. We're delighted to have Ian Gilzane with us, Chief Architect from the Scottish Government. Ian's going to say a few words, and I'd just like to thank Ian as well for working in partnership with us to host What If Scotland, when it should have been in Venice, but we're absolutely delighted it was in Dundee instead. Ian, over to you first, and then Hussam. Hey, thanks, Leonie. Um, yes, and good, ev good evening, everyone. Uh, so on behalf of the Scotland and Venice Partnership, I'd like to also offer a warm welcome to everyone tonight, to tonight's event. Um, and also I'd like to thank the v and um, Dundee for hosting uh, What If Scotland uh, and in being such a fantastic partner uh, and delivering what would have been our 2021 20, Venice Biennale project um, here in Scotland. Um, and on a personal basis, I'm, I'm also pleased to have been involved directly in the What If Scotland project through the, the West of Hills element of the project. And on tonight's theme, I'd like to reiterate how important uh, the 20 minute neighbourhood uh, concept has become in relation to government priorities on COVID recovery, <clears throat> climate change, and living well locally. And I've done a number of uh, presentations on 20 minute neighbourhoods over the past um, few months. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to seeing how our brilliant panel of speakers address addresses this that issue tonight. Um, so um, I'm, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the discussion and I'm really pleased to see such a diverse audience uh, joining uh, tonight's event as well. Um, so I'll hand over to Hussam, who's going to chair the event, and thanks again to the VNA for hosting uh, the exhibition and also the, the series of events. Uh, very good afternoon and good morning to our, our, our audience, wherever you are at the moment. And thanks for Leonie and for Ian for the introductions. Uh, um, my name is Hussam from University of Dundee. Now, before I, we kick on with our fantastic speakers, I've been asked just to set the scene and just giving some thoughts, ideas about the, the concept in itself. And then I will just uh, uh, briefly introduce all our speakers uh, in, in, in the order that we, we've got. Now, uh, what you're going to see briefly, those five, six minutes, is just uh, it's the work we have done over the last three, four years as part of our Dundee Urban Lab with our colleagues in uh, Dundee City Council, Pierce and uh, Conros Council, but also our international work with the Damascus University as we applied the concept as well, the City of 15 Minutes Neighborhood, working with, our, with different agencies, governments, local authorities and the practices uh, in the UK. Now, what the pandemic show us, if I may say, I think the pandemic show us, a, show us a clear opportunities, a clear lens for us to how we see the locality, the locality of our area, the locality of uh, neighborhoods. More than ever, people now are in control of their time. In the sense now, working locally, working at home, give us the opportunity to start either earlier or later, but also having more break. So this idea of people now in control of time, they start and appreciate more than ever uh, 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 access to green, access to public spaces, access to, 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 high, to, to, to high streets. So to me, whether it is 10 minutes or 15 or 20 minutes, it's, I, I should, we shouldn't be obsessed about the numbers. It's a new way of living. It's about the locality and uh, living, working and prospering locally. I have to admit, this only happened in the affluent neighborhoods. This was a great opportunity only in affluent neighborhoods. Meanwhile, this wasn't the case in the most deprived areas in, in worldwide, not only in the UK, where people maybe not have uh, access to decent home, to uh, green parks, amenities, facilities within five or 10 or 15 minutes. So there is something about inequality. And I think that the 20 minutes neighborhood is a great opportunity to address, uh, uh, to address this uh, uh, issues. 
Uh, also, let, let us put, the, put it in this way. To me, you can't just understand neighborhood in isolation from the city. City is as well keyed in this sense to me. And there is two trends, if I may say now worldwide, when it's come to how we design, how we plan, and how we manage cities. The, 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 the slide to the left show either cities, let us put all the resources, the money in the center, and if the center flourish, and assume it will flourish economically, environmentally, everything else, everything across the city will flourish. That's to some extent right. But the problem with that, sometimes that makes the city so attractive sometimes, and put it under pressure because everyone will aspire to go to the city sometimes, and just most of the time buy cars. So distance become not an issue. And sometimes distance demands more transportations. So, and this is why we see the sprawl and so on. Meanwhile, to the right-hand side, there is a trends in some European countries like Freiburg, for example. No, city should be a city of connected, vibrant neighborhoods. So rather than putting all the resources in the city, no, we put it as well in, in, a, in a neighborhood. So that's make the, the, the distance sh shorter that, and that's power, give power more to the core of the neighborhoods. And that's to tell you the truth. Lots of research show that reduce the, 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 the dependency on the car and reduce the aggregate, that's quite important, the aggregate CO2 level. Of course, I am not saying here we shouldn't invest in the city center. It's absolutely we should, but it is making balance between the city center and the neighborhood. So that's quite a crucial. And recently, just the mayor of, of Utrecht, the city of Utrecht in Netherlands, they, they put a vision for 2040. They want Utrecht, a city of 10 minutes, <laughs> rather than 15 or 20s. And they start putting this idea, it has to be inclusive. So I really want, like this idea, how they link the 10 minutes with inclusivity. So they want a home for everyone, amenities for every, everyone, mobility for everyone, and shopping for everyone. The challenges we have with, with our current neighborhoods and the way we build neighborhoods, it's really, we have lost the sense of neighborliness. We really lost the neighborliness. Only we felt neighborliness came back with the lockdown when people saw, start interacting more, having more social interactions. The problem, the challenge with current neighborhoods and the way we build it, there is always evidence of declining public health, especially with the way we built suburban houses, rural houses, and even the, the houses located at the edge. With the low density, there is limited uh, investment always associated with con congestions. And a lot, a lot of research show there is poor accessibility and social isolations. What is a neighborhood? I really like this definition in the sense neighborhood is not a place. I found that interesting. It is a state of mind. One in which our hearts are open, we, we connect with others and care in a way that maybe perhaps could be even could love. So we need to bring this sense of neighborliness. This is by putting people first. And as you can see in the, these pictures where children play, that streets used to be, if you look 50 years back in Dundee and elsewhere, street used to be the extended living room where people interact, play and so on. For me, after a lot of re research and, and, and applying it in Dundee, Bears and Conros and uh, elsewhere, three things are important to, to bear in mind. The distance, how can you walk in 20 minutes or up to 800 meters? Is everything you need is available within this distance? So that's quite important. But more importantly, we need to have a new lens on density and intensity of occupation. The reason why I put those together, it's not enough just to understand density on its own without understanding how many people live there. How many people live there? If you look at Dundee and Bears city center 60 or 70 years ago, in the blocks and the flats, four or five people used to live there. Now imagine the average, the average household in Scotland is 1.5 or two people maximum. If you don't have enough intensity in the neighborhood, there will be no rationale to support businesses and facilities we need on daily needs. So we really need to start thinking carefully and combining intensity with density. And the rule of sums, unfortunately, in Scotland especially, we deal with a very low density between 30 up to 45. 
I think we need to have a new of thinking on how we tackle density and the range of density and with intensity. And just I will finish so uh, so briefly. Another things has emerged on the back of uh, uh, the uh, pandemic and the concept of 20 minutes neighborhoods. Now, some European countries now, they are starting working on what they call it. How do we activate the rule of green planning? In the sense, they, they establish a new formula called 330, 300. What does that mean? Every person should have a view and access to three trees from window, from the window. And the neighborhood, every neighborhood, regardless where, where that neighborhood located, should cover should be covered by 30% by tree. And any person should have access to green park or green infrastructure within the first 300 meters. This is Utrecht, and they start really embody, in, trying to embody, in bringing this in, uh, ideas into all neighborhoods. This, the, the latest thinking as well, I came across from the mayor of Utrecht for 2040, they start establishing barcode for each neighborhood in their uh, idea in order to understand what is there and what is, what is missing and how we make it better. Because they know quite well this needs uh, uh, pushing and uh, pushing, uh, bringing different disciplines together, breaking the silo thinking, bringing different departments. And the only way to do it, establishing this kind of smart barcode. And I would urge, hopefully, Scotland and UK will do the same. But we need to bear in mind, the answer is for solutions. Neighborhood, to me, is accumulations of plans of different layerings. It is about physical interventions, absolutely important, but also about how we shape perceptions of the local and how do we encourage the decision makers to, 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 to take the right decisions. And this is like a jigsaw. It's not located in one hand. This is needs proper partnerships between communities, local authorities, practices, and so on. Thank you very much for your time. Now, let me just start by introducing uh, our speakers. Uh, the, the first speakers for today is Ewan Anderson. Ewan Anderson is uh, an urban designer, an architect who leads 7N Architects, an Edinburgh-based design practice who specialized in generating innovative ideas that make better places. And the second one is Heather, Heather Eklaridge. She's a planner, designer, and geographer with more than 13 years uh, public sectors experience with the Glas Glasgow and across Scotland. Heather has worked a lot on various initiatives to do with the climate change and regenerations using design led uh, innovative, innovative methods. And the last speakers for today as well, we have Krish Nathaniel. He, he is a, a, a special practitioner uh, working at the intersection of urban design, spatial, spatial justice, and play. He is a principal urban designer for London Borough of Harrow. The floor is yours, Ewan. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you very much. Just let me share the screen. Yeah, good evening, everyone. I'd like to uh, tell you a bit of a uh, bit about the What If exhibition at, at BE Dundee, which Leonie uh, talked about in her in her intro, really to give a bit of context to um, to this evening's discussion. And this all started with the theme for the uh, 2020, as it was Venice Biennale, and the theme was how will we live together. We've ended up in Dundee, which actually has been really really positive. But the response to this question was, well, the first thing if we're going to discuss how we, how we live together is, is to actually talk to each other and to engage architects and designers very directly with, with citizens throughout the country. So we paired 25 uh, architects and designers around Scotland with very directly with in one-to-one -one, um, dialogue with 25 citizens. And we picked five places which were geographically very different from the very north of the country down to the south of the country, but they're also all very different spaces. We had city spaces, we had towns, quite remote islands, rural areas. 
and we had very different perspectives from these different places. And in each of these places, we asked the citizen to come up with a wish, and we asked the architects to come up with an idea which responded to that wish. There was a very direct relationship there. And we fixed on, on the wish because it, it just seemed to capture a spirit of inherent optimism. And we used what if because it allowed the ideas to be brought forward in a non-challenging way. So to get away from the idea that the architect, the designer is the answer to everything, it's, well, here's the wish. And well, what if we did this? And if that actually isn't the right way, what if we did that? It's a very, a much more engaging conversation, which was really fundamental to the whole initiative. So we start in Lerwick in the, in the very far, uh, far north, a, a very different context to the central belt of Scotland. We went down to the south in the town of uh, Annan, Elgin, uh, a more rural setting perhaps, Paisley uh, to uh, the west of the country and finishing up in Wester Hills on, on the edge of Edinburgh. And of course, what came out of the whole process was that we, we did part two, the sequel, if you like, in Dundee. And we've been working on five workshops with the VNA uh, team over the past month. So uh, the, the workshops have been ongoing uh, throughout the exhibition run and have fed back into the exhibition. And it's been given the exhibition a real uh, purpose and drive and energy. And the outcome of all of this is, is exhibited in, in BNA Dundee. And it's, it's an exhibition we put together, first of all, to, to capture the, the real energy and um, drive of the idea of the wishes from the citizens and the, the, the ra very wide range of uh, creative uh, responses from uh, designers and architects. And something that came out very strongly from this was that there was a very diverse series of, of, of wishes, and there was a very equally diverse uh, responses, a series of responses from the architects and, and the ideas. And what was interesting is that some, a great many of the responses were actually non-physical. They weren't necessary to do with spatial planning. And at its very simplest level, uh, one citizen uh, who had been cared for most of his life just simply wanted to decorate his own, in his own room. Others were concerned about rising sea levels in, in Lerwick, and some simply wanted to improve the, um, the town centre of Annan simply by just cleaning it up and, and making it a lot tidier and thinking about, well, how could you actually get that, that going? So the ideas are generally, and this is a panel from the, the, one of the Dundee workshops, the ideas are, were purposely very communicated in a very, very straightforward, tangible way. So we wanted to break away from the, the, the fundamental schism between the, the professionals who, who have the ideas and, and design cities and those who actually live in them to get into this very direct relationship where there's a wish, there's sketches, and there's ideas that flow from that. And we, were, we referred to it during the, the, uh, the workshops almost as architecture unplugged, how to kind of remove the bureaucracy and get back to a very, very simple relationship and conversations, which we felt were absolutely fundamental to this whole process. And this has all been captured in the exhibition, a series of five wonderful films by Bash Art Creative, which have been taken in each of the five places, which if you can see the exhibition, there'll be links circulated, which have each of the five films. But I would urge you to try and go to the uh, V&A uh, Dundee if you can, because it's on a massive triptych screen and you have, it's a very, very immersive experience and Bash has done this fantastic job to really capture the, the, the essence of these places. But perhaps to conclude, my, my favorite part of the exhibition is what we call the cloud of dreams where all the wishes from all the places and the five places plus Dundee have been captured, plus every visitor to the exhibition has been encouraged to write a wish their own wish for the future of their place on, on the back of a card and, and it's hung from the, in the uh, key space in the exhibition. It's been growing as the exhibition's gone on and it's forming this kind of massive cloud of ideas. And what has been very satisfying that is really captured a real sense of optimism and, are really, and the energies coming forward from everybody. And I think in terms of the site's discussion, I think what perhaps would be interesting from my perspective is that there'll be a lot of talk about uh, 20 minute neighborhoods and 
15, 18, 20 minutes, 800 meters and all the rest of it. But it's a fantastic initiative, but my plea is, and my challenge in a way is, can the softer side of things about every, these diverse perspectives on people's ideas for the future of the place, can that, can that be found a base of how we move forward and develop this concept of 20 minute neighborhoods so it moves away from being a, a, a much better, much better intentioned approach to spatial planning to something that also becomes a, a ground up um, approach to how we make uh, neighborhoods much better places for everyone. So thank you for listening. I'm now gonna hand over to Stephen Willisey from Aarhus, who's always got fascinating insights. So Stephen. Thank you very much, Ewan. <clears throat> fantastic work, this. I've gone through and seen some of the films, the links you've sent to me. It's fantastic work. Um, I wouldn't say now for something completely different because it's not quite true. Um, I should start my video as well. I'm just switching that on. Can you see me now? Hopefully. Um, I'm sitting in a town called uh, Aarhus. Can you go to the next page, please? Uh, we're located, located in Denmark on, the, on Jutland. You probably remember Denmark during the European Championships. I think Scotland beat Denmark, although Denmark ended up going to the semi-finals. <clears throat> Just a little fact, fun fact. Um, we have close connections with Scotland, of course. And what I would like to focus on here is this idea of working with cluster, village clusters. Uh, next slide, please. There's a group of people working in a, you can see Aarhus on the, the left-hand side there. It's only a 50 minutes drive or an hour's drive, depending on where you are, to this region. But it's a, it's a tendency going on where we in Aarhus are attracting four to 5,000 people every year, that this region here um, on Mols, it's called Mols, is actually depleting, depopulating. In a period, and the area here is roughly 3,770 people today, but in 2010, between 2010 and 2015, 113 people left the, the area, and uh, 66 children left the area too, and uh, there's a great influx of elderly people moving into the area, 238. So there's a, a kind of an unbalance developing, and there's a tendency towards the council wanted to close down schools and the whole infrastructure was threatened. So a whole bunch of stalwart citizens started asking the question, what if we actually started looking at this and working together and, and rather than protesting, actually start working with the council. Next, please. You can see this area here, there's uh, the village clusters throughout Denmark. It's a, it's a movement taking place and the one that I'm talking about here called Mols was the first to actually start this. And it's actually gained a, right, a, a lot of momentum. It's about 20 villages. And the interesting thing is they've actually started working very closely. Next. Distance is a funny thing. I think it's also a distance in the mind. I've, I've drawn a circle, a radius of seven and a half kilometers here, which encompasses quite a lot of these villages. But the important thing is that um, um, by talking together and looking over the shoulders and across the parishes and the different uh, societies and clubs, they're all facing similar problems and challenges. And so they started working very closely together. And you can see, for example, here, this idea of distance is not necessarily a question of driving in a car. There's new tendencies, the electrical bikes and scooters where a lot more uh, um, closeness between these small communities can actually be connected in a different way than before. Next. So they've been focused upon trying to build upon the local qualities in the area by making a, a fantastic sense of place, looking at the local quirkiness. Each village is not the same. They have different qualities, different locations, different landscapes, different hist histories, and there's a whole bunch of people who've got quite interesting backgrounds and histories. So looking at the special characteristics, they try to search for the potentials and try and solve some of the challenges they've been facing. Next, please. So this is one of the furthest 
villages away called Urbu. There's a very few, it's, a, it's almost, um, it's a small, very small village. But they, I, instead of just reading through the text here, I presume you'll be able to get access to the slides afterwards. There's opened up a sense of corporate cooperation across the areas of many activities and activities that people weren't aware of. So slowly they started finding out that we don't all have to do the same things. Maybe us villages can have certain characteristics which could be interesting for other villages to use and utilize and working. This signpost is actually out on the uh, Helioness on the tip of that peninsula, where you can see all the different things that can actually happen there, which have become qualities. And uh, people cycle, a lot of people cycle around, also tourists are becoming more and more aware of this. Next. Here you can see a slaughterhouse in one of the areas. It's quite a famous one. And um, you don't all have to have a slaughter. Uh, or a slactory in the area. So, I mean, this, this one has actually uh, flourished in the, in, the say, in the later period because of the opportunities for opening up for the local communities. Next. Here you can see a farmyard, as it's, it's been predominantly farming uh, landscapes. There aren't very many uh, small farms, uh, small holdings left. They've been bought up and, uh, into larger conglomerates. But it's obvious that the, what has happened is there's a, a greater sense of fellowship in, a, in the local communities. And these are quotes from people who are living in these different communities. Um, and they're finding out this collaboration rather than, than conflict is the way forward. Next. Seeing this area as one rather than just small enclaves Although the idea of neighborhoods is very important, they're actually seeing this whole area as one. They call they call Molbo, as the, uh, I, I like Glaswegians. It's like the the, Mol, the people from the Mols Hills, and um, there's a very strong um, affinity with each other. And it's there's 200 um, Stolhort citizens who are actually working very hard uh, as volunteers, connecting the different communities together. They're working with communication. They have, uh, they've chosen, uh, there's 23 different working groups and these are ad hoc. They're not organized by the council or the, or the council is very involved in this. Um, but they got, they start and they have, when they've completed a project, they just closed down again. There's a steering body and there's a, a, a each, each village has an ambassador. And they're the connectors with the council and the steering body and the other cities in the councils. Um, next. So um, I can't see the text here because of the, the slides on the, on the side here, but uh, the point is that um, instead of commuting to Aarhus twice or going further afield or to other areas to participate in sports activities or communicate in different groups, They've actually congealed here to make something which is quite unique. So we can actually come home from work where a lot of people actually commute to Aarhus, stay in the area, and it actually become a, a, an area where people want to stay and actually returning to. So you don't have to commute, commute twice. The last slide here, and a couple of slides, is just some volunteer groups. This is called the Generations Meet. 10, 12 joint events throughout the year making communal gardens, uh, communal dining, creative workshops. The benefits of the, of the small children from the elderly people is fantastic. We've just built a building in Aarhus called Generations House, where these different bodies are actually working, elderly people living there, but the kindergarten is open for them, so that actually the elders could go there too. Next slide. It's gathered so much momentum that a philanthropist group called Real Dania has actually gone into the project. And one of the larger towns in the area called Kniebel, they've actually managed to collect enough money to make this new uh, meeting place called Knudpunkt. Uh, it's going to be built in timber and uh, it's going to be a new meeting place for this community, for this whole area. Uh, some of the old buildings were being moved, but it'll be the state of the art and it becomes a fantastic focal point for the neighborhood. Next. So this, this has been studied and uh, an evaluation has been made. And in conclusion, 
they are saying that it's highly recommended for the communities. And I think also we can learn a lot from this also in urban situations uh, where smaller towns closer to our city of Aarhus can actually start working collaboratively too. And the point here is, next slide, is that we can't do it all on our own, but we can, we, but together we can. And I think this is the whole essence of this uh, project and this culture that's developing, that people given the right to work together and support where the council is a facilitator for enabling these things to happen, it's a great way forward. And with that, I'd like to say thank you and uh, introduce Heather Caldridge, who's going to talk about her talk. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stephen. I'll just share my slides. On the 23rd of March 2020, Scotland entered lockdown. Movement was limited, and the, for the majority of us, the instruction was stay at home. This part of the story I'm sure you're all very familiar with, but for some rural communities, this was a watershed moment when the true strengths and fragility of their place came to the fore. For the Strathard area of Loch Lomond and the Truthicks National Park, overnight local centre Aberfoyle showed to have few facilities that serve the everyday needs. Only a few weeks earlier, park officers, local stakeholders and other partners had come together to workshop scenarios, exploring the potential impact of not a pandemic, but the extremes of climate change on the area. Overnight, the reality of living in a place not fully resourced locally turned from an inconvenience into a significant impediment. The lived experiences of the 930,000 people currently living in rural Scotland will of course differ from individual to individual and place to place, but the desire to have more facilities closer by that make daily lives easier and in some cases viable is likely to be universal. So how might the 20 minute neighbourhood concept land on the ground rurally in Scotland? Firstly, Distance will always remain a challenge in applying 20 minute thinking to a rural context, with much of remote Scotland living over a 20 minute drive from a local centre, let alone a walk or cycle. However, the, if you take the essence behind the 20 minute concept, trying to limit single car trips, save carbon and support healthier lives, let's not underestimate the investment in active travel networks like canal towpaths, former railway lines, coastal paths, and the mainstream of electric bikes to go some way in enabling access to local facilities in a 20 minute style rather than 20 minutes real time. Also getting younger rural generations growing up with a mindset that cycle commuting is the default. In places this might mean creative thinking of how main roads are overcome or humanized to allow safe travel between home and facilities. Of course, this won't be possible for everywhere or everyone, and in particular with significant aging population that Scotland has rurally. Yet schemes like the Slate Community Trust electric bus offer a potential starter model for elsewhere. This is delivering sustainable community transport through the Slate Peninsula and Sky, through a seven seater minibus, allowing access to shops, health facilities and onward connections. Yes, let's talk about creating density. And of course, housing needs to be clustered to support compact places. But this is really important. It needs to be affordable, carbon conscious, and mindful of how it could help new and existing rural economies. Currently, the lack of affordable housing has seen an increase of nearly 50% in six years of people on the Highland Housing Register. And moreover, 31% of households in Shetland currently live in fuel poverty. However, there's lots of good examples around Scotland of different approaches, like community-led housing in Gearlock, or housing delivered as part of a larger place plan, like in Blaumaha. The importance here is to create new or repurposed homes, which are plan-led and respond to the place. So whilst lockdown has shown us great digital potential, people do, do still need to have physical space to feel part of a place. This is where the reprogramming of buildings with new and existing uses could play a key role. 
Could a boating club be used as a hot desk space for local practitioners during the week? Or the kitchen for a startup bakery business? Could health professionals be based out of community space rather than local medical hub? Could more diverse and creative activities help younger generations see future purpose in their local areas? Finally, rekindling rural place identity is a important part of this conversation. It could be harder to connect things together when they don't know or agree what they are as a whole. In Huntley, the local arts organization, Devon Arts, worked with communities to explore the identity of their place. This resulted in a rebranding to reflect local spirit, landscape and activities, and replaced the fairly indistinct brand given to them by external consultants. So I'm gonna end on my what if. What if the essence of a 20 minute neighborhood um, was applied to rural communities? It would be place specific, designed for and with local people and support greater sharing and be designed over time. What if? Thanks very much. I'll now pass over to Krish. Thanks, Heather. Just sharing my slides now. Great, everyone should be able to see that. Um, prepare for some lurid pink and green slides to brighten up your Thursday, folks. Um, so just to begin, so this is the provocation that Hassam and the team at VNA Dundee set me, and I've approached this as something of a, a manifesto. So as well as working for um, London Borough of Harrow, I'm, I'm also um, architect in residence at Glamis Adventure Playground in, in East London in Tower Hamlets. So there's, a, there's a definitely a focus on play in, in what's coming in the next slides. So firstly, can young people shape the built environment? Um, can they, and if so, how? Uh, so yes is the short answer, and, and whether it's rural young people building dens in local woodlands or young people in cities um, building play structures like at Glamis, that shaping of the built environment has always happened to some degree. Um, and it's particularly enabled uh, in towns and cities by free and adventure play settings and allowing for a degree of risk through play. And so when I'm, when I'm talking about risk, I'm really meeting fire, jumping off things, climbing things, at that level of, um, of individual um, autonomy that, that children and young people can develop. Uh, so, I mean, adventure and free play have massive benefits for childhood development. Um, but I think what we've seen over probably the last those 40 years is, is, is a gradual de-risking of society and a kind of a risk aversion within the built environment as well. So how can we once again allow for young people to, to become valued features of their neighbourhoods? So one way I think is by engaging them um, in planning development and governance. Uh, however, this approach I think has its own shortcomings, which I'll move on to. Uh, another is, is simply creating spaces which offer young people degrees of independence and that risk and autonomy I mentioned. And thirdly, it's by embedding what we already know about successful environments for children. So using those case studies, those precedents and rolling them out as an urban design strategy. So step one in this kind of three, three step manifesto of sorts is recognizing the limits of engagement. So the involvement of young people in development can often be highly tokenistic. And I think that process, particularly um, in major cities has really eroded trust in the um, engagement and um, engagement process at large. So I think that's something to be aware of. I'm noticing youth design panels and uh, community review panels being set up um, by a number of local authorities, and that can go some way in providing an oversight for young people's interests. And likewise, genuine co-design process can be can have a huge impact, especially for, for public realm and play schemes. But lastly, I, I just kind of a word of caution, really, to remember that one of the best ways to serve young people is by advocating for them. And it's um, often the case that engaging with a group of planners or urban designers is not really what they want to spend their afternoons or evenings doing. So I think Tim Gill, um, who's the author of a great book uh, called Urban Playground, puts it best here. Um, so he says that we need to directly advocate on behalf of children to make that case in City Hall. We can't hand over the job of making neighbourhoods and cities work well for children to children. It's our job as adults to step up to the plate and have a leadership role. So 
step two is really about designing for independent mobility. So when I say independent mobility, um, I'm talking about the everyday freedoms we all need to get around our local neighbourhoods as we choose freely doing so. So for young people, this could be going to school or the shops or just hanging out with friends and playing outside. Um, so Dinah Borner, who's done extensive research on, on young people in the built environment with her practice, ZCD, um, puts in a really, really great way in terms of children's independent mobility and the right in itself. So around the theme of uh, independent mobility, what measures can we put in place to allow for these freedoms? So we can set built environment goals with child autonomy and safety in mind, as well as prioritizing a sense of ownership for young people. We can also, in a very uh, practical and real way, which I'm sure we're all aware of, reduce vehicle dominance. Um, additionally, we can look to expand our thinking about this element of families, providing local free childcare and highly flexible working patterns. We've seen the beginnings of that perhaps in COVID as well, um, as well as delivering public spaces which encourage and welcome teenagers and providing the funding for youth clubs and services to support this. So this is just um, a few images, Marmalade Lane, people might be aware of, it's a car free um, play street as part of that scheme here, just on the outskirts of Cambridge. So thirdly, um, is basically about looking to create a pro-risk loose parts urbanism. I think I've covered the benefits of risk earlier, but in terms of loose parts, um, well, loose parts is, is effectively a, a theory from free play, and it's based on the ability to freely move, redesign, tinker with materials in a play setting. It was first outlined by an architect, Simon Nicholson, in the, in the late 1970s. So really thinking about loose parts and urban design means allowing young people to freely shape parts of the built environment, tinkering in the same way, creating opportunities for risk and autonomy at the same time. So how can we embed these principles? Uh, well, firstly, we can blur the lines and remove fences. So a playground, natural park and public square can be all those things um, at the same time. We can bolster the things we do do and expand them, such as adventure play and incidental play. So this is the work of, of Muff on the left, uh, King's Crescent Estate in Hackney. Um, we can actively put ourselves in young people's shoes, such as with initiatives like Urban 95, the Bernard Van Leer Foundation, and that's imagining the world from the height of an average three-year-old, which is 95 centimeters, and using that concept to have wider impact for parents, caregivers, and using the concept of loose parts um, within the built environment as an education tool. So just on the right is a scheme for early years, um, children and play space in Peru. It's one of 12, um, 12 spaces they've created recently. So just to end on, I'd really like to talk about how this applies to 20 minute neighborhoods um, and what that might look like. So I've, I've taken three of the features from the um, town and country planning associations 20 minute communities guide and just kind of made a few suggestions as more of a scrapbook um, so yeah i think effectively we have the evidence base we have the case studies in so many cities and towns throughout the world and also in rural settings it's more an exercise for decision makers and empathy and advocacy and actually building on these but i'll just and things there and I'd like to invite um, all the panelists back for a discussion. Many thanks very much. Now, really very impressive. The, the, the three speakers really raised some fantastic, interesting points and we received some good points and good questions. I would like to kick off, if I may say, with some really interesting questions we received earlier and I will ask the panelists to come forward if they've got any answers or any comments to share with us. One of the comments we came, what role do you feel libraries can play in the growth of 20 minutes movement and 20 minutes neighborhood? I can see Stephen. Stephen, do you want to go with it? 
Yeah, fine. Um, libraries are often the focal point of a lot of communities and uh, they've become destinations and uh, they're like magnets, of course. And I think um, we have a beautiful library in Aarhus called Doc One, uh, but it's a multimedia building. It's a whole series of different activities. I think libraries are changing their role from being just a book place to being a more a community place and a meeting hub or a place for where lots of different types of activities can take place. I enjoy going around our library a lot. I just, I have an office very close by. So sometimes in my break, I go for a wander around it. to so just, it's like a covered urban space because there's lots of different pockets of spaces uh, designed so that lots of different types of users feel comfortable. Uh, it's also university town. So if you get there early in the morning, you get a say a reading space. But just around the corner, there's a kindergarten area, a father group, not just mother's group, a father group where you can uh, have a room for toddlers, a library for toddlers, uh, where they have got a, a, a space which is soundproof, so they can actually make a lot of noise. So it's, uh, I think the, the term library is maybe not the right word. It's, uh, it, maybe we could talk about um, another type of community hub. Any other observations from other Heather. colleagues? Heather. Yeah, I, I just wanted to come in and um, I suppose pick up on what Stephen was saying and, and having visited the, the library that Stephen's talking about on, in our house. And I think if you look at that, it's pride of place on the waterfront. You know, that's a political decision to put your community facility right, pride of place on the waterfront. Um, I loved when I was there that, there, people were registering the birth of their newborn um, right. by ringing the bell. So there yeah. was new traditions being made as part of that library. And I think that's that layer of um, 20 minute neighborhoods that Ewan was talking about it. It's much more about just the physical infrastructure. It's about the memories. It's about, you know, those new traditions that you're making. And I think, you know, that is a good example. So I would totally agree that whether or not, you know, a library in the form that I would think traditionally of a library, um, you know, stands, I think it is about that community hub and about that um, decision that um, a local authority makes on where they put it as part of that central kind of compact place. Very good. I think there's also something about the, the kind of spatial qualities often with libraries as well. I mean, I'm thinking about some of the privately operated public spaces in kind of cities in, in the UK, say, or in Europe, where you're likely to get moved on if you'd stayed for an extended right. period of time, something like that. Yeah. Whereas, you know, you can you can dwell in the library it's comfortable it's quiet you're not going to be readily kicked out and that allows for um you know space for it could be adult education it could be um kind of an informal citizens advice bureau those kind of interactions um or even formalizing it and, and like um Stephen said kind of co-locating um you have one in hackney by sir david ajay yeah which one's that a, a beautiful uh, library. I can't remember. It's a bookstore. I, what what it's called? It's got a different name. It's, it might uh, be the Idea Store. In Idea Store. Tower, yeah, in Tower Hamlet. So that's what they call their. Tower Hamlet. And it, it's your yeah. hood, right? And I I've visited it several times. I, you know, I just I just look wandering around in there, either in the middle of the week or on the weekend. It's there's um there's courses going on for unemployed. There's lots of different fa facilities taking place in that wonderful building. Um, and, and I see it has a, as another function, just obviously there's books there and things, but it's maybe not the priority. Totally agree with this observation, especially now with people now fancy this hybrid mode of working from home and sometimes from offices, more and more they are looking for spaces in their locality for how can I say meeting and for chatting and actually one of the observation from the audience said it's a, a, it should be a, a community anchor where it is a place for learning meeting or even being a citizen and I really found that an interesting observation now the second interesting questions we receive as well in this era which is more increasingly built for isolated experiences and and digitalization. 
how do we get buy-in and implementation of infrastructure for more social and community behavior spaces? Ewan, do you want to go, Ewan? Yeah, I'll go. I, I think something that came across very clearly in the whole, in all of the what if workshops is that uh, everybody was really suffering from the isolation of being in lockdown. And I think, yes, we have become more detached through digital communication, but really the, the importance of human interaction and just being with each other and the sense of you know, belonging with other human beings is something which I think has, has really come to the fore. You know, as, a, a, as we come out of the, the pandemic and, and lockdowns almost realized, made us all realize what we, what we missed. So although there's, you know, there's been a trajectory with how we communicate digitally in, in recent years, I think there's a, the, what we will find is that there'll be a renewed sense of um, people feeling a sense of belonging. It's something that certainly came out very clearly in the, uh, in the, uh, in the workshops and it because the, the interesting thing is that the dundee ones were done post lockdown and the the other five were done just pre-lockdown and you know certainly there was a marked uh difference in in, in what people were, were looking for as a result of that but i think the sense of belonging is perhaps something that's perhaps at the root of all this we're talking about the scale of spaces and really how people feel that they belong to a neighborhood or a particular community is about breaking down the scale in, in many respects. And I think what if, what, what if is tapped into is, is that people feel that they have a sense of in not just engagement, but in almost a sense of an empowerment. And I think I come back to the point I was making in, in my, my talk that as well as all of the wonderful things that are associated with 20 minute neighborhoods, it has to be uh, integrated with a change to how we go about actually planning these spaces and doing it almost turning the whole process around, which the planning bill in Scotland has sought to do that through local place plans, but arguably it needs to be further embedded in the planning system so that the, these conversations are the things which actually drive planning policy and how, how things are actually delivered and places are made. Yeah. Any other observation from Heather? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, I think, did Stephen want to come in or will I, no, I please, sneak Heather. in there? Please. It was just as when you were kind of reading out the question, I was thinking that actually, you know, physical infrastructure, that's absolutely needed. We know that's needed as part of you know, physically connecting the 20 minute neighborhood. But I suppose the way we design that physical infrastructure needs to be um, with the idea of what social experiences does it create? And what popped into my head was a project I love in Rotterdam, which was a big yellow bridge that was crowdfunded, that was put through a part of um, Rotterdam um, to um, connect, you know, a dis disparate kind of part of the city center but it was used for so many different things like restaurant kind of pop-up events and um, people having, you know, um, experiences on it. And I think perhaps maybe projects in Scotland, we think about, you know, getting the funding just to get them delivered, bridge infrastructure, and actually we maybe miss the other things that they could be part of, the real placemaking, you know, so what if a bridge infrastructure was about, you know, a pop-up um, table that people from the community could have dinner on it. You know, I think that's what the creative kind of layer we need to start to think about 20 minute neighborhoods and infrastructure in a different way. And perhaps that maybe means looking at the way we procure teams, multidisciplinary teams, you know, artists are quite often brought in later on in a project or you know other people so I think we need diverse teams to create um, as well as that strong community engagement. Yes. Stephen? Yeah I, I maybe just a slightly different angle on this the um, one of the things that's really blown me over during this uh, pandemic is this this whole uh, media, uh, digital platform which is which has actually opened up a lot of opportunities to actually uh, work from home, 
rather than commuting into work or you know splitting it 50 50 maybe in the future it just means that your local community can be supported even more by being where you are rather than commuting to work somewhere else which is maybe where you're not investing much time in the urban environment where you're actually working but you can actually spend more time at home i i think also there's something about uh, demographics here the age group thing uh, my, I noticed my children, they've been very comfortable with the um, digital media. I think the elderly, the elder you become, the more isolated you can become. But I think there's a, we can learn from this and say that the digital media can also be something which the elderly group can actually be a part of more so if we use more time on that. So that maybe local uh, have difficulty getting around but they can actually get into communities on, online. Uh, the, ment the mental uh, space of community space is an important one. I think, uh, I mean, this whole thing about uh, shopping online, it's completely changed the way people are shopping now afterwards. And I, I, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. It just means it's gonna make a lot of our cities losing shops. And it, we're gonna have to start reinventing the way we look at our local shopping streets and, and so on. Uh, something's happened during the pandemic, which is both, you know, can be dis discussed as being evil or unfriendly, but it just means that's just the, the technology leap has taken place. There's a big push. And I think there's a vacuum there, which us as designers can, can really make a difference. And I'm thinking, Krisha, with your beautiful projects working with children, uh, I was almost saying pop-up activities in certain instances, there's a lot of potential in that way of working. And I can imagine you work with artists as well, as uh, Heather was saying, I think there's a, there's a whole bridgehead of opportunities coming along for us. And I think we have to map them and find out where we're going. And I see this as an opportunity for us to get back in the urban realm, take it back, so to speak, as long as it's got qualities, you know, thank there's you. a lot of potential. Thank you, Stephen. This, thank you. Just I'm mindful of the time and there are some really fantastic questions. Now, I, I would like to move to another interesting subject Heather and Stephen really raise as well and generate a lot of interest and questions about this issue of rural communities. Especially there is one to do with relying on groups who work together. But that may need initiative, facilitation, leaderships amongst groups of different size community. How best can that be established so that each community does not feel threatened, but sees cooperative, cooperative opportunities instead? Any observations, Stephen and Heather? Well, this, I mean, well, Heather and I were on a little bit on the same page here. I think, uh, the work that we've been, the people who've been working in these different communities on Mols, this district just out of Aarhus, has been going on before the pandemic. It's that, you know, between, there's a tendency happening and it's not just because of the pandemic. It's something that's, there's migration of people from the countryside to the city. And there's, um, because of the pandemic, there's also a possibility that people want to go back to the countryside, especially children. So, I'm very concerned about the state of our welfare society and the way we can finance it. Uh, it's not necessarily about increasing taxes everywhere. It's just this co-creation and uh, willingness to work together and not compete against each other in, in these small communities around about, but actually seeing opportunities to you know, make synergies with each other. And uh, one of the important things here is that uh, I talked about the stall stalwart people people who are actually very resilient and tough and really want to make a difference. And they, I think um, they found two, 200 of these in that community of the 20 villages. And uh, they were do all these different projects, but the council has to be involved too. And this is very important. Um, it's a win-win because the council don't necessarily have to pay a lot of money in uh, financing a lot of projects. It's just that the willingness of the citizens to participate together can be encouraged and um, allowed to uh, grow with the, the facilitation of the council. 
Uh, there's a, a lot, they talk a lot about the communication between the different communities. So they, they, they choose ambassadors from the different villages. It's not necessarily the members of the parish council, uh, like we have in the UK. It's maybe some other people too who are, who are really engaged because they, they want to save their school and uh, the, they, they actually take over the school and the running of the school. There's some really exciting uh, tendencies taking place. Yeah, Have I just want to come in on what Stephen was saying, and I think we'll be in agreement. But I mean, if you think about the trend that lockdowns created, it's the affluent who are moving to the countryside. It's the people who can. And I think that's a worrying trend for rural places, particularly underlining that, you know, the need for affordable housing. Um, and, you know, perhaps maybe a new model needs to be made around, you know, who's moving to an area, what skills do they have, as well as what cash do they have, you know, mm -hmm. um, I, when I was chatting with my friend who lives in the south of um, Shetland, um, she was saying that community activities is hard. Often it feels like a chore. There really needs to be a purpose to it. Otherwise, why would you not just go to somewhere that's most convenient for it? So I think the idea of really getting stuff that's purposeful, uh, that doesn't feel like a chore, that doesn't feel like a drain, that then you can see an uplift. So that, you know, idea of reprogramming spaces. So there's almost that critical mass of activity. So people kind of see, I want to be part of that. And it kind of generates its own. Um, I think that's, you know, all part of the conversation that needs to be kind of generated. Yeah, definitely. I'd, I'd echo that. And I'd say that um, in England, particularly, there's a, um, there's kind of a tension with the Localism Act and community plans and community, uh, sorry, neighbourhood plans and neighbourhood plan making and, and that kind of um, inequality in who participates and who engages to form those because it's often the people who are retired and have the time to do so or are on higher incomes and don't have, you know, long, long working hours or child caring responsibilities and that kind of thing. Um, so ensuring that neighborhood plans that are actually representative of of a rural community or a, or a kind of a semi-urban community in a small town um, is really necessary and I think that's been the problem with the localism act in England is it's just been a here you go do what you want very little support so I mean something like a kind of resurrecting the community technical aid centers or something but for localism and for kind of generating neighborhood plans um, will be fantastic as I'm, I was thinking about this in terms of uh, uh, special uh, local characteristics or the quirkiness of a, an area and trying to develop the, these in, in, in creating strong, strong identities for, for these local communities. Um, I, I, I just see the landscape and the historical cultures and uh, the people who are living there. There's lots of stories. They, when you talk... When, they, when you have that generation's meeting point, that it's predominantly ladies actually that run that, I have to say. Yeah. Uh, it's just an interesting thing that, um, um, where are the men? Maybe they've died, I don't know. But I just see this, this, uh, this opportunity of mixing people together under the same roof, so to speak, or in different circumstances. It's, it's a catalysator for something really interesting, just, just, you know, just happening. You know, the, the stories from the old generation going to the kids and the kids and the energy and the, the joyfulness they bring to the elderly, it's just magic. You know, you're sitting watching this, it's amazing. Yoen, do you have any observation before we take the final questions? And I would like to have the view of four of you. I'm perhaps jumping ahead, but I'm, I'm, I've got on screen one of the, one of the questions which is talking about is, is local government and centralization a barrier to this? And I would say, yes, absolutely, absolutely it is. So the, for 20 minute neighborhoods to be successful, and I, I remember you know, the diagram you showed earlier of a series of kind of concentric rings which were overlapping and the concept of a city being a series of interconnecting neighborhoods, there needs to be a de degree of decentralization and empowerment to kind of generate the sense of belonging that actually gives these places an identity. It's not just a spatial planning, not just a physical thing. There has to be an empowerment that actually goes along with this as well. 
Excellent observation. I, just on this point, we receive an interesting questions, and this is the final one. I would like to, to hear the view from four of you, please. How big a barrier is the local government structure score or slash scale to creating strong neighborhoods? That's one. And do the panel believe there is a real appetite to decentralize services and decision making? And what needs to change? Thank you. That was three questions. <laughs> that was three questions. I mean, I, I, Hussam, I, I, sorry I jumped ahead and I actually started answering one of those already. Um, I think the forum here, we're, we're, we're not going to change the whole process of uh, national and local government overnight here. But I, what I do think is that the planning process is a big part of that. and moves to to turn around the whole process rather than engagement being reactive to a plan but actually the engagement is the process which writes the brief which creates the plan is a very simple shift there is moves towards that in scotland already but i think if there was a silver bullet in all of this i would say it's something nearer than that brian trying to change the whole nature of local government in the country but that in itself i think would be uh, a very clear act of empowerment, which should be a very strong catalyst to generating this sense of real empowerment. And I think something I often find myself thinking when it will be done charrettes around the country is that the most valuable and most valuable thing in any, in any community is actually the energy and the positivity of the people who live there. If that can be harnessed in some way, fantastic things can be, can be achieved. And I, that may sound like a kind of slightly motherhood and apple pie or apple clappy view, but I, I do firmly believe it, that if there's a clear, strong uh, sense of common purpose about how a place can be made better, it really helps to coordinate everything, every energy and every resource towards that outcome. So I would say start with the, uh, a deliverable piece of changing the way places are governed and actually look at the planning process and how uh, local plans are actually driven by um, the place plans, really. So if, I, if you allow me to say one thing I have taken from you, a clear common purpose, having a clear common purpose. Yeah, absolutely, a clear, a clear vision, a clear sense of common purpose. Yeah. I think that I, I, I recognize that from my uh, experience from this, this community, I've been all these twenty different villages. They've actually uh, seen a, a big problem coming along, and they've actually started talking together through dialogue. Um, the space where that has arisen is it's it's a long process. It's been going on now for like uh, seven, eight years now. But um, they're actually very well organised, and it's all it's actually grassroots. It started from within. And the council have seen the potential in this and it's actually become a movement and you can see it happening in lots of different uh, communities around so this this whole thing about having a clear vision and um I, you know this idea of having a burning platform can actually bring people together or a, a, a beautiful crisis like covid19 you could say it's a terrible thing but it does bring people together I want to just jump in. I know we're probably rushed for time. Yes, we are. Yes, thanks. Heather. For me, it's not about, you know, thinking about a, a restructure of government at the moment. It's just about giving officers more time. You know, so many times I work on a project and it's like, right, OK, we need you on to somewhere else. And you don't get a chance to build up the trust that's needed. You don't get to see projects through, you know, and I think it's just a simple matter of actually thinking that, to build up trust, to actually truly work in partnership, it takes time. Give us more time. Krish, final words, please. Thank you. Yeah, um, so, so the questions were, are local authorities a barrier to this form of localism and is overly centralized government a barrier to this? Um, I would agree with Ewan in that I think planning departments are too reactive, have been too re reactive and need to be um, and, and kind of the vision for development needs to be 
local authority led but but also shaped by local residents as well i mean you know why not master plan an entire district um at a relatively high level it could be a series of master plans neighborhood led um i've been part of a design coding process at the moment and, and design codes are um obviously coming through in in great number now um and i think kind of setting a shared setting shared design principles to try and guide to development is, is really helpful but I think also just team structure is, is, is incredibly important and less siloing and so more talking between the planning team and the um, regen team if they're called the regen team um, and you know or if they're called the place shaping team but you know having having I guess moving back to a position where there's kind of a, a greater overview of what the vision is and then also what the reactive element is in terms of what's coming in in applications um yeah so it's kind of a combination of <laughs> all three in a way thank you very much for our panelists panelists and apologies i we are a bit running out of time now and now i just want to hand it over to my colleague in the vna uh, leone and thanks for the old panelists again well, thank you Hussam, and th thank you to all our our panelists that was like going on a bit of a field trip without going anywhere. And I think it probably reminded so many of us how important it is to actually experience other places and other ways of doing things. Um, so thank you all for that. I don't think I can even begin to sum up that the conversation ranged from systems instructions and who holds power within local and national government and whether policy actually leads to direct action and all those things. But actually I think it was a thoughtful and considered conversation and um, so thanks again to everybody for joining and thanks to Sam for, for steering a panel who just wanted to keep saying more and um, it's it's not easy to do that we've all been there so um, it was uh, skill skillfully done thank you and um, I think there's something just to end on though just in terms of the conversations and conversations like this and I'd just like to take a moment to thank you all for joining us um, and for actually adding your, your voice to that conversation one of the great things about online events is that actually you become a really active part of the conversation as an audience and then those that want to can take it onto Twitter as well with our speakers who I think are largely all active on, on Twitter. But I'd just like to end by actually uh, doing a couple of things. One is to thank all the partners involved in Scotland and Venice. So the Scottish Government, National Galleries Scotland, British Council Scotland, Creative Scotland and of course Architecture and Design Scotland who have actually done an incredible amount to support the project to not go to Venice and to come to us in Vene Dundee support us at VNA to add Dundee as a new element along with 7N Architects support. It's just been really, really critical for us in this city and also to Architecture in Scotland for all their support and working on events. And I loved all that library chat. There's a library coming up in Paisley, which is very close to my heart, where I worked for a few years. And within that positioning of a new library within Paisley High Street actually is a, an incredible communication of of how much a citizen is valued by that local government and I think still have eyes on what Renfrewshire Council are doing in terms of their cultural regeneration but back to extend the library conversation just a little bit further as we close we have lots of conversations in VNA Dundee about how we could be more like a library we'd like to see ourselves as a museum that is understood as a library an everyday part of life in the city that is welcoming them for, welcoming them for everybody across the city and, and beyond and actually doing events like this I think helps us to try and achieve that that aspiration so um, we hope to be able to have more and more in-person conversations but online conversations about the discourse and thinking that goes into the design and architecture in, in, in Scotland and actually really importantly is what if is done bringing in residents and citizens across neighbourhoods to be active participants in that conversation so we have two more events coming up within this programme before the exhibition closes on the 21st of November We've got one that brings in our colleagues who led on the Irish Pavilion um, called Entanglement and of course the British Pavilion as well called the Garden of Privatised Delights, picking up on some of the themes that um, were spoken about tonight, about the importance of public and civic space and actually what that means in terms of our, of our, of our human rights as well. So that event is on the 18th of November. Uh, no, it's not. It's on the 21st of October. Apologies. The one on the 18th of November again touches on themes that were drawn out tonight and again something that's very, very close to v and Dundee has been a fundamental part of how we worked even before we opened and that is what what if young people designed our future so do come along to that on Thursday the 18th of November if you want to be part of that conversation as well and that has a, a focus on climate change and 
younger people now obviously be more affected by that than any other generation in the history of time. So um, thanks again for joining us. It was great to, to, to listen in and to go into field trips into all of your minds. Thanks for joining us. Good night.